we're still working our way through features of volcanic rocks. And in the textbook, this was 241 to 279. And we've been going through effusive eruptions where the gas is uncoupled from the melt. And now we're going to change to explosive rocks and explosive textures. This is going to be Roman numeral 7. We're going to start it off here with just explosive rocks and textures. And what we want to do here is just kind of name what do we call the different rocks and textures that are produced by explosive eruptions when the gas and the melt remain coupled in a special way. And we have a variety of different textures here. There are really three, and this is analogous to sedimentary systems where we have clays and muds and uh, silts and sands and cobbles. Well, with uh, volcanic rocks, what we end up having is ash, lapilli, blocks, and bombs. And so let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's see, how do we do, okay. Here to here, and what we're going to do is we're just going to label some things. Now, ash, lapilli, bombs, and blocks are all called pyroclasts. Pyroclasts is material that has been fire broken or fragmented by an eruption. There are synonyms for pyroclasts that include tephra. Another synonym for this that might be used in a textbook or in talks that you're hearing someday is ejecta. And what each of these words means is particles fragment particles produced by fragmentation of melt. Yes, let's do that. These are our particles produced by fragmentation, explosive fragmentation, right, of melt. And when things are pulverized and smashed to the smallest size possible, well, then those very, very explosive systems are making something called ash, which is this. And in fact, this is the interesting thing here, right? There's a scale bar that tells us these are very, very fine. They're basically a powder. Whereas cinders I want you, um, and lapilli, these are like the gravels that you might see used in landscaping. And blocks and bombs, these are things bigger than a golf ball, although they could be the size of a house. And so we're going to go through now our different pyroclast classification. And it's just done by size. Maybe a little bit based on is it pumicious or vesicular or is it dense? And we have our three different size fractions. We have our ashes. Oh, let's just call it ash. And an ash is any material that is less than two millimeters in size. And you can have fine ash and coarse ash um, as sub um, categories, but we're not going to worry about it for the purposes of this class. The important thing about ash is this represents a, that's not how you spell powerful, powerful pulverization. Pulverization. Right, the melt has really been smashed apart by an explosive eruption. Oftentimes with ash, what we see are shards of broken bubble walls. That's how I would like you to describe what does an ash shard look like? Well, it actually looks like the shard of broken bubble wall. Where a pumice or a foam basically has just been totally shattered. And you can start to see that here that there are these kind of cuspate curved margins. And the classic shape for an ash shard is this tricuspate appearance. And I'm going to put that word here, tricuspate. That's the classic shape. And what it represents is a, is a place where three bubbles were once present and we're just seeing the glass from that interstice. But you can also see bubble sh or, um, ash shards that are curved or something like this. But anyways, they tend to look like broken bubble walls. Now the next size up is lapilli. Lapilli is any material between 2 and 64 millimeters in size. Sometimes the word cinder is used to describe lapilli. So I'm going to go ahead and put the word cinder here. That tends to be when it's a basaltic material. And lapilli can either be pumicious, bubbly, or dense. And so if we were to sketch lapilli, we could draw just like a dense fragment. 
or we could draw something that is pomicious. And so with something pomicious, we want to have like a bunch of um, bubbles, bubble walls, and then we'll have this all irregular, and there's bubbles in the interior, and there's smaller bubbles in the interior. And so that's maybe what a lapilli could be. And even on the size of your computer, that's the right size for what lapilli is. And now finally, we're going to get to blocks and bombs. And these are things anything bigger than 64 millimeters. So three... Uh, we'll say it, we'll do this, we'll go bombs, down here we'll go blocks. And the difference between these two is what their fluidity was when erupted. Both of them are greater than 64 millimeters in size, but a bomb was erupted molten where a block was erupted, where it was already quenched. And so what ends up happening, so we'll, we'll put the word uh, quench. It doesn't even have to be quench. It could just be wall rock, really, that gets blasted out of a volcanic eruption. Well, of course, that's already quenched. But the important thing is that a block is angular, whereas a bomb presents some evidence that it was molten. You can see in this example of a bomb that we have this spindle shape that forms because it's shooting through the air like a cannonball and as it's interacting with the air we're getting a fluid dynamic morphology so what we want to put there let's say something that's kind of simple let's just say that it can have a fluidal morphology or fluidal form or you get something called a um, a, a bread crust bomb a bread crust bomb is cool, right? You know how bread on the crust, well, I don't know if you like to eat crust or not, but no matter what, on a loaf of bread, you got this hard crust, and sometimes it's like cracked on the outside, and on the inside, we have the fluffy loaf of bread where everything is more vesicular. And the same thing can happen with a bread crust bomb, and that is that we have this quenched outer rind that shatters. That's actually kind of what's going on here. And on the inside of this, it might be more vesicular. Anyways, those are our different classifications of pyroclastic material that you would use to describe rocks that are volcanic. Now, each of those pyroclasts is produced by a different type of eruption style. Now, all of the eruption styles for an explosive eruption have a gas behavior where the gas remains coupled to the melt, but the degree of coupling and the form of that coupling will control how powerful the eruption is and what the eruption actually looks like. So what we're going to do now is to finish off this little mini lecture, we're going to go through the different eruption styles. And for each one, oh, didn't need to scroll down there. Where am I going? Whoa, I scrolled down really far, guys. Sorry about that. So for each of these eruption styles, we want to talk about the explosive mechanism, how, what kind of tephra is produced, and how that gas is behaving. There's four of these, and we're just going to shoot through them kind of one by one with a little sketch and a little note. And the first type is called a Hawaiian eruption style. This happens a lot of times in Hawaii, and it's a really neat type of eruption that occurs often in basalts. And what you get is a, uh, we should go for a picture first, yes? Let's put in a picture. Okay, so here's a good picture of a Hawaiian eruption. And what we see here is basaltic magma that is being jetted out of these different craters. And it's remaining very fluid. It's very hot. Um, it's very low viscosity. And those are important words here. So for the Hawaiian style, what ends up happening is that there is a gas jet that drives a very small amount of low viscosity melt from the conduit. So a gas jet drives low viscosity basaltic melt. That's the thing that's actually driving the eruption. The form of the eruption is called a fire fountain most of the time. I think you can see why. And what's really interesting about these fire fountains and, and the fact that there's this gas jet is that you might think that most of this is magma, the stuff that's being exiting, that's coming out of the crater, but it's not. It ends up being like 70 to 1 is the ratio between gas to melt. So if we were to like draw this really poorly in the conduit, what ends up happening is like you get like this melt that's on the edges of the conduit. And there's this just huge amount of gas that is pumping through that pipe. And every once in a while, a little speck and particle of basalt gets 
brought through um, by the gas to create this fire fountain. The material that gets produced by the Hawaiian eruption is not as fragmented as other eruptions, and um, most of the time we talk about it making spatter. Spatter is material that's still liquid, and what spatter can do is it can uh, recongeal. Recongeal to lava because it hasn't lost enough heat, and so the spatter comes out and lands on the ground and recongeals to form lava. This will also provide produce some small amounts of ash and also uh, bombs. And you can see some bombs sp slash spatter coming out of this eruption. All right, that's our Hawaiian eruption style. Let's go on to the next most explosive, and that's the order we're doing this in. This is the least explosive, and we're heading towards the most explosive. So the second most explosive type of eruption is called Strombolian. This also tends to occur in basalts, and the key word here is slugs, because bubbles are going to coalesce I'm going to actually draw this one first in the conduit. The viscosity is low enough that bubbles are able to find themselves, right? Like, it's like here's a bunch of bubbles, and those bubbles coalesce into a bigger bubble. And these slugs then rise up through the magma chamber, not the chamber, the conduit. Here's some more bubbles. And when they reach the surface, they blister and burst. And when they blister and burst, they pop. Uh-huh. Let's throw here a picture in of a Strombolian eruption, and you get this repeated periodic bursting of a big bubble slug at the top of a volcano. The explosions themselves are not terribly powerful, but what's neat about them is that they're just so repeated. All right, let's try to put some of that stuff now down in the notes. Word-wise, we're going to say bubbles coalesce. These are smaller bubbles. They coalesce into larger slugs, maybe even meters across. And these slugs then rise and burst. That's our picture of how gas is behaving. And when the bubbles burst, they that's the eruption. So we'll say forms periodic bubble bursts. They tend, I'm going to put the word here, small, because they're not huge eruptions. They're smallish eruptions. Uh, the things that they produce, we get a lot of ballistic bombs. Ballistic means they, like, so if here's our crater, the ballistic bomb is going to travel like a cannonball and then land on the ground. So we we're talking about ballistic bombs. We're going to make some ash, and that's mostly it. We're also going to produce cinders, and we're using the word cinder here because it is a lapilli-sized basalt. And both Hawaiian and Strombolian eruptions are primarily occurring in basalts. Now, as we get to more felsic, more silicic um, magmas, things uh, increase. Well, what thing? Viscosity increases. And as a result, our explosions get more and more powerful. So the next type of eruption we're going to talk about is a volcanian blast. And blast is a really good word for a volcano eruption because it acts like a cannon. Pressure is built up and like a bullet shooting out of a gun. This is a very sudden and powerful event. Um, here's a picture of a volcano blast caught. Uh, it's not the best picture you've ever seen. One thing that's cool, see this right here? That's not a cloud. That's actually a shock wave coming away from this big, powerful blast that's occurring. Look at here. See this material? Those are huge blocks of the volcano and the wall rock that have been shot into the air. These are all important aspects of volcanium. Let's put some notes down here. The gas, we're going to say this, gas pressure builds under a viscous plug. Viscous plug. i got to get that penmanship better. And eventually, that viscous plug, which is sealed, can't hold back all that pressure anymore, and so a discrete cannon-like blast occurs as the eruption. So when the pressure is overcome, let's say this, we produce a discrete cannon-like blast. And that <clears throat> is what a volcanian eruption 
looks like. And what we even get most of the time is a shock wave that gets produced. Type in Volcanian Blast to YouTube. Maybe you'll even find this exact video and you'll be able to see and hear that blast occurring. Because these are so explosive and powerful things, they produce a lot more ash than the previous eruptions. And because it's more viscous, things shatter more. There's also a lot of ballistic blocks that get shot out from these volcanoes as the plug and the wall rock is disrupted. There's also bombs that are produced. These tend to be the bread crust bombs. If we were to make a conduit sketch, a real simple one, what we have here at the top of the conduit is a plug that's viscous and sealed. And our bubbles are building up into this big pocket below the plug until eventually it has too much power from all that, those bubbles that are trapped and it bursts. And now finally, the last eruption style, we've finally gotten to it. This is called Plinian. And this is our most powerful volcanic explosion type. This is what you, like when you think of like a classic volcanic eruption, you are picturing in your mind a Plinian eruption. We get this beautiful eruption column. Here's an example from down in Chile from a couple years ago. All right, this is what you picture with a volcanic eruption, with an eruption column and an umbrella region. And we'll talk about how all those form in the next lecture. But basically, to just carry on with our current setup here with the Plinian eruption, the melt and gas, we could say bubbles here, stay coupled. It's not a gas jet, it's not a bubble plug, it's not a sealed thing, right? Which in the previous styles, here they stay fully coupled. And as they stay fully coupled, the energy is trapped and there ends up being a very powerful result from this. The, the form of this is an eruption with a classic plume, with classic plume, and the explosion can actually be sustained for many hours to even days. We'll say just for many hours. There's so much gas that is driving this thing. It produces <clears throat> a lot more ash than the other types do. But nearer to the vent, you could imagine smaller ballistic things shooting out as well. But most of this material through all here, this is all ash. So that's predominant. And then there are some ballistic blocks and bombs. Now I actually want to talk to you about plenty of eruptions in a lot more detail, so we're going to save that for next time with a big drawing that we will do. See you then.